want to become happier and healthier? Do you want to learn from a very, very prestigious doctor today? Well, I'm very blessed because on the first episode of the Cancer Conversations podcast, I have a very special guest who is the first UAE National Breast Surgeon. Now, we'll talk about all about breast cancer, how to prevent, detect, and cure cancer. If you don't know me yet, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Wanda Lintan Kaliti. I am the number one most influential Filipina on LinkedIn 2021. Also, top 15 LinkedIn expert in Dubai 2023. Now, I'm starting this Cancer Conversations podcast because after my mom, you know, got this lung cancer, I realized there's so much need for people to be aware how to prevent, detect, and cure cancer because right now, globally, there are about 90 million plus cases of cancer that was you know, registered in 2020. And breast cancer is the number one cause of cancer for women. So today, we will talk on this first episode all about breast cancer because our purpose is, of course, to inspire story, to share knowledge from experts. And before I bring my guest on stage, let me introduce her. Dr. Hoya Kazim is a UAE national and the country's first lady surgeon. She attended medical school at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and has a Master of Public Health from the University of Texas in Epidemiology and Disease Control. She obtained a double fellowship in general surgery from the Royal Colleges of Surgeons in England and Ireland before subspecializing in surgical oncology and breast surgery and reconstruction at the Royal Mastern Hospital in London. She worked as a volunteer in the Caribbean and a visiting breast fellow at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Boston before she returned to Dubai in 1998 to take up a post-breast surgeon at private hospital. In 2006, she set up the Well Woman Clinic, a multidisciplinary clinic staffed by women for all women's health needs. In addition to her clinical work, she founded and runs a breast cancer support group and charity, Breast Friends. She is an adjunct clinical assistant professor at Mohammed bin Rashid University of Medicine and Health Sciences and is a freelancer writer on women's health issues. Now, without further ado, let me bring Dr. Korea on stage. Doctor, thank you so much for seeing me. Hi, Coach. How are you? <laughs> All good. Doctor, I'm very honored. You are my first guest for this Cancer Conversations podcast. I know your time is so precious. So let's start the ball rolling. My first question to you, you know, being the first UAE national lady to be a breast surgeon is something that's so prominent. And, you know, I think it's one of a kind, I'll say. I want to first honor you for that. Maybe can you share what inspired you to become that first UAE national lady surgeon? <laughs> first of all, thank you for having me on your podcast. Um, I... You know, it wasn't something where I had a goal in front of me that I was like, I want to be the first female surgeon for my country at all. And it actually, I, I come from a family of doctors, so that's the first thing. So it wasn't mm -hmm. a surprise that I actually went into medicine. And my father was a surgeon as well, though uh, an orthopedic surgeon, and it definitely wasn't something I wanted to do. My, my sort of um, heart is more into public health. I, I like the idea of taking care of communities um, rather than the individual. And so I actually went to medical school wanting to do public health. And um, uh, I, I don't know why somehow I got sidetracked halfway through uh, medical school. Somebody put a scalpel in my hand and I was like, oh, wow, I love this. Um, and, and the thing is, because I look back now, I mean, we had no female surgeons in um, when I was mm. training, zero in the whole country. I trained in Ireland, zero female surgeons at the time. And the surgeons that were there, which were men, were these old mm. grumpy men. I mean, you know, mm. they would be throwing things at you in the operating room. And, and I look back now and think, did I really look at them and think, yeah, I want to be like that? 
So I don't think I did, but I, I somehow, after I sort of got the idea that I like this, I came mm. back to college for my internship. And that's when I started seeing these advanced cases of breast cancer uh, mm. that I had not seen during my training in Ireland. And I also saw that women were very modest. So I was an intern and the only female on the team and they wouldn't let the consultant or even the ones just below consultant come in to examine the patient, but they'd let me examine them as the lowest on the, the rung of, these, of this ladder. And um, so I realized then a couple of things. So one is that they really need female surgeons here because we had no mm. female surgeons here either. And also that, you know, women with breast cancer were presenting really late. I mean, it was appalling to me as a woman that, you know, your breast is right under your nose. It's right there. You see it every mm -hmm. day. You know, It's not like it's on your back or something or inside <laughs> your body. It's right there. And that a woman would know something is wrong. And for yeah. various reasons, whether it's modesty, whether it's just fear, um, would not do anything about it until it was too late. So those mm -hmm. were the things that was in my head in terms of you know the country needs female surgeons i actually like it because i realized at the end of medical school this is what i like and the need um in this particular field so that's that's sort of how it happened so it was really and and honestly everything i've done career-wise has been that you know recognizing a need and then seeing how can i fix that or if i can fix that <laughs> I love what you said, Doctor. Recognizing a need and finding yes. how you can solve it. Now, yes. I know, Doctor, you know, in terms of statistics, I did some research. They said there are about 19.2 million cancer that was detected in 2020. And breast cancer is the most common cancer globally with over 2.3 million yeah. new cases. Now, Doctor, I know you've been doing this for like 18, 20 years. Maybe you can shed some light first in terms of detection. I know you rightly said, you know, the breast is under our nose, but first women are scared to even, yes. you know, recognize the pain and even see the doctor. Now, what do you think are the roles that genes play first in terms of developing cancer? So there's quite a lot to unpack there. So first, <laughs> is, <laughs> first are the numbers. You know, the numbers are scary. Um, if you look at um, women, for example, and cancer, just to put it into a more uh, personal or individual point of view, one in three women will get cancer at some point in their life. It could be any cancer, not just breast. So some obviously get it as babies, some get it as children, mm -hmm. and if you're lucky, yeah get it in old age. So one in three women will get cancer. So that's pretty bad. And mm -hmm. now obviously there are different types of cancers and some cancers are what I call good cancers. People always ask me, is there such a thing? And there is yeah. such a thing. <laughs> Breast cancer is actually one of them. And uh -huh. if you, again, if you look at the statistics, you will see pretty much for most of the common cancers, they're all on the rise, all of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the good news, because I always like to spin things from a positive point of view, the good okay. news is that less people are dying from these cancers. So what does that mean? It means mm -hmm. we're picking it up earlier, and it means mm -hmm. the more we are treating it better. We've become so good at treating cancer, even in my own sort of career from when I started to now, um, the way we treat cancer is so different compared to when I first started. So those are, that's to put things in perspective. Yes, more people are getting cancer, but less people are dying from it. So it's becoming now more like a chronic disease. It's becoming like um, mm -hmm. I've got diabetes or I have hypertension. It's not that thing that when I was doing my internship that yeah. people presenting so late and people afraid because the fear comes, if you present late with a cancer, if you leave a cancer till it's really advanced, then most mm. likely you're going to die from that cancer. So then everybody else who's watching this now mm. kind of equates cancer and death. But mm. as we have become better treating it, as more and more people are living having had cancer, 
now it's it's not okay we have it but life goes on the same way with other chronic illnesses in terms of um you were asking like how to pick it up so the the classic mm. sign of a breast cancer is a painless lump in the breast so oh. if somebody is pre usually that's how it presents now people yeah. have said to me, well, I have pain. How come it's still a cancer? So it doesn't mean that if it has pain, it will not be a cancer. But mm -hmm. that is the classic presentation. It's a lump with no pain. The second most common thing that women will present with is um, a bloody nipple discharge. So blood mm -hmm. coming from the nipple. Now, what we want, though, is we don't want you to feel that lump. And we don't want you to have the nipple discharge. We want to pick it up before you pick it up. And that's where screening mammograms come in. So basically a mammogram is, is an X-ray of the breast. And what we want to do is pick things up when it's in a pre-cancer stage before it forms a lump, before it causes a nipple discharge. And that is, that's a difficult thing in, in many respects, because when we talk about screening for anything, screening for colon cancer or doing pap smears for cervical cancer, the idea of, of actually being proactive, of actually not waiting until you have an issue to go and sort it out, but actually trying to sort it out before you have the issue. And that was a very difficult thing when I came back to Dubai. It's a bit like wearing seatbelts. You know, I grew up in the time where we didn't have to wear seatbelts. Um, <laughs> And now, of course, we don't think about it. I get in the car and you put it on like brushing your teeth in the morning. You don't actually think about it um, or negotiate with it. You just do it. And it's getting better now uh, compared to when I first came back about women having screening mammograms. Now, the next step, what was the third thing that you asked? On okay. that? Let me summarize first before I move to the next question. But I think I love what you said that cancer is increasing, but the good news, you know, less people are dying. So I mean, really, it, that's good news that people are getting treated. And I think it's good that you share that, you know, detecting through the mammogram is one of the yes. best ways to to get known even before there's a lump or a blood in your nipple. Maybe yes. this brings me to the next question because you also mentioned there, you know, science have progressed so much in terms of yes. treating cancer. Can you share what really are the ways to treat, uh, you know, a lump in the breast even before it becomes cancer, you know? Well, no. So, I mean, obviously um, we have all kinds of lumps in the breast and the majority mm -hmm. of lumps we have are not cancer. So oh. the first thing is that if somebody presents with a lump, obviously in their head, they're thinking, I've got cancer, I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. But 90% of lumps in the breast are not cancer. So the, the first oh. thing is to actually show it to somebody. Um, mm -hmm. And that is so the, the first thing a doctor will do is they will do some imaging, mammograms if you're over 40, ultrasound scans, and then if necessary, a biopsy. So mm -hmm. this is coming to the diagnosis then if it is not a cancer if it's completely benign then you don't have to have surgery you can follow it up there are other types of lumps in the breast not everything is either a benign lump or a cancer we have many different types of tumors you get in the breast and the management of those tumors will be according to whatever the um, biology is on the biopsy so that that is the that that's what we would do if somebody presents with a lump as i said what we try to do is try to find things before a patient finds it. So um, screening mammograms, so just to mm -hmm. let people know what a screen is versus um, what a, you know, a, a mammogram. If somebody presents to me with a lump, I'm doing a diagnostic mammogram. I want to know what that lump is. Screening mm -hmm. mammograms, the same machine, but what this is a woman who has no issues and we don't feel anything in her breast, but we want to see that inside is also fine. And we mm -hmm. usually start around the age of 40. Um, every country is different. Some do it every year, some do it every two years, some even every three years. For me in my practice, I try to um, individualize it. So one is um, what's the family history of this woman? So you were asking about mm -hmm. genes. 
as part of the uh, uh, your question, um, the majority of breast cancers actually don't have a gene that we can find. Um, only 10% mm. of cancers are caused by a genetic mutation. But if somebody has a genetic mutation, then I'm going to screen them more often than if they don't. Or even if they don't have a genetic mutation, but they have a strong family history, I will screen them more often. So there are various things that I look at to decide how often I need um, a patient to do screening mammograms. So remember, screening means you have nothing to feel and you have no symptoms. You just want to check regularly be, to see if, you know, God forbid, something does come up. Wow, that's very good. Then screening mammogram is one of the best ways for you to even, you it's know, it. yeah. Exactly. But doctor, it's why do you after 40 years old? Yeah, so there are various reasons for that. One is the breast tissue tends to be dense when you're younger. If you remember your breast when you were a teenager, it's slightly different <laughs> than what it looks like yeah. now. So when uh -huh. you're very young, the breast tissue is denser and you have less mm -hmm. fat in the breast. And then as you uh -huh. get older, the breast tissue starts to regress and it gets replaced by fat. And when you become a granny, it's mostly fat. So when we radiate the breast with the mammograms, the radiation doesn't penetrate the dense breast tissue as well as tissue that's not. So that's one reason we don't give it very young, because obviously the reason for giving you radiation is we want to get some information at the end of that mm -hmm. test, right? The other thing is that, you know, you are going to have re um, mammograms regularly for, you know, most of your adult life. So starting... So the reason we, and, and it's still radiation and the effects of radiation are cumulative. Radiation is actually one of the things that can cause cancer. So obviously mm -hmm. we don't want to give you more than you need. True. So that's another reason why we decide. A third reason in some of these countries are, is that the government is paying for the screening mammograms. And so obviously mm -hmm. they try to, you know, they want to balance with screening their population with the cost of uh, screening. So that's a lot of times why it becomes a three-year screen instead of a one-year screen. Mm, I understand now. Now, doctor, also, maybe um, you can, I know there's a lot of mammograms. I mean, I know through reading and research and talking to a lot of people that cancer can be treated in three ways. You do surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation. Now, yeah. Um, are there any other non-surgical treatments that's possible for breast cancer? From your we have a lot. And this is what I was saying to you about mm -hmm. how good we have become at treating breast cancer. It used mm -hmm. to be really, I look back now and I think, oh my God, I can't believe we used to treat patients like that in a very non-scientific way. So we would say mm -hmm. if a cancer was over two centimeters, it got chemo. And if it was under two centimeters, it didn't. We now know that the size of the tumor is irrelevant because you can have a small but very aggressive tumor and you can have a small, mm -hmm. really kind of, you know, lazy cancer. So size has nothing to do with it. Now we are really getting into the biology of the tumor. Is it feeding on hormones? Are there any other proteins on the surface of these cancer cells that we can target the same way that an antibiotic, for example, will target certain bacteria? for example. So we do that. Mm -hmm. So in, in addition to surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, um, and not everybody, so pretty much everybody gets surgery, not everybody gets radiation and chemo, but we also have, in addition to that, um, we have uh, immunotherapy. So how to kind of uh, modulate our immune system to attack mm -hmm. cancer cells. And we have what we call targeted therapy. So some breast cancers have a protein on the surface and we can literally make like an antibiotic to that. So it's like oh, an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if, so if I just tell you, you know, chemotherapy works generally because we have many different types of chemotherapy, but generally chemotherapy works on cells that are dividing quickly because that's what mm -hmm. cancers do. And, yeah. But it doesn't know what's a cancer cell and what's not mm -hmm. a cancer cell. So that's why your hair falls out, because in normal life, the cells that are dividing tend to be our hair. So your mm -hmm. hair falls, but your eyeball doesn't, because your eyeball is not 
the, the cells are not uh, growing every day, whereas your hair, those cells are. So the chemo kills any cells that are dividing, right? But this target of therapy is really looking at these cells that have this protein on it, and this would be the cancer cells. And so we have specific treatment now that only kills those cells. So we have quite a lot of treatment in our arsenal now, and that's why you know, every cancer is different and how we treat it is different. And that's why more people are living, to be honest. Yes, we are picking it up earlier by screening, but honestly, the treatment um, and the way we treat cancers um, is is really is what's driving the survival rates uh, from cancer. I think what we need now is to start looking at why are mm. the cancer rates going up? for almost all cancers, why? Exactly, that's the next question, Dr. Wright, why? <laughs> I don't <laughs> like, know, I mean, I'm gonna guess something to do with um, lifestyle, environment, mm -hmm. you know, we, we know that there are lots of um, chemicals that we are in contact with that are hormone disruptors. We know that two thirds of breast cancers are hormone sensitive. I don't think it's going to be something as easy as you ate this, therefore you got cancer, or you drank this, therefore you got cancer. But there's certainly, I think, for most things in this world, that it's a combination of um, your genetic predisposition mm -hmm. versus um, and, and and some kind of carcinogen. So you mentioned, you know, I'm sorry to hear about your mom and and lung cancer. Um, many lung cancers are related to smoking, not all, but we all know people who have smoked their entire life and never got cancer. And then mm. we know people in their 40s who smoked a little bit who did get cancer. So same cigarette, same nicotine, which is, which is a, a, a carcinogen, same carcinogen. Why are some people getting cancer who, uh, who don't smoke that much and then some people who smoke a huge amount don't get cancer. So there is going to be a kind of a combination of your own individual uh, DNA and how mm. it responds to the carcinogens that we are in touch with every day. I agree with you because really, doctor, when my mom was diagnosed with lung cancer, she said, why? She never smoked. She never you smoked. Know, she never said, I mean, yeah. I think that's the because at least you can say, well, you smoked, therefore you got cancer. Yeah, I think at least I can say, ah, because mom, you did this. It is no, like, bless wow. her. Bless her. <laughs> yeah, no, so it's not all cancers are, are from, not mm. all lung cancers are from cigarette smoking, and not all cancers can we see a link to something very specific, you know? So it's, it's as I said, some are, for example, the 10% of breast cancers that are linked directly to a mutation in your genes, something mm. that you've inherited, it's in the family, but that's only 10% that we know so far. Exactly. So, yeah. So I think that's where, now that we've become so good at treating it, I really think we start putting our resources into why, you know, what have we done to our food sources, our water sources, our environment, the pollution, you know, we know th all kinds of things are related to disease. So I think that's what we should be looking at now. That's my public I, health background. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you, doctor. You know, while I was in the hospital, I mean, I spoke to a lot of patients and I think every person has been through a lot, but I think it's both in all aspects, you know, mentally, physically, mm -hmm. emotionally. I mean, yes. I've met a who got cancer but she's very healthy i mean she's doing exercise she's eating yes. only healthy food yeah. so why right but yeah 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 it, no no i have marathon runners who are getting um, breast cancer you know so it's like why why yeah. so it's very um it's a really tough uh tough thing no doctor maybe you can i understand there's no one answer to the why but maybe you can share what are the proactive steps for people to minimize the risk? I mean, let's talk about prevention now. How can you prevent 
you know, um, getting cancer, breast yeah. cancer. Or so there's, uh, I mean, when we look at risk factors, so mm -hmm. uh, as I said, it's not generally one thing, you did this, therefore you got cancer. Yeah. But we know that there are risk factors. We know that people who are overweight, for example, if you have a high BMI, you mm -hmm. are more likely get breast cancer than somebody who isn't. We know the genetic, we know the genetic link in some people. Yeah. Obviously, there's nothing you can do about your genes. Well, mm -hmm. a little that you can do about your genes. We know that people who don't exercise versus people who do exercise, so the ones who don't have a higher incidence of breast cancer. We know the other things that are more hormonal. So for example, having your having your first period um, uh, uh early and having your last period late so in other words having more periods over your lifetime uh -huh. um, is, is a risk factor so for example catholic nuns um yeah. because they don't have any children because normally when you have children when you're pregnant and then yeah. lactating you have a break from your period but uh, yeah. nuns because they don't they don't get married and have kids and so they actually have a slightly increased risk compared oh. to um, compared to people who have children. And then, um, so there's a lot of things like that. Alcohol, for example, is very mm. strong to breast cancer and other cancers, not just and, and other diseases, not just cancer, but definitely alcohol is linked uh, to breast cancer. So there are many. So there's some things that you can't do, obviously. Um, genetic mutations, you've inherited it, though there is a lot being said about um, uh, epigenetics, which is, um, okay, you have a genetic mutation, but mm -hmm. we know even in people who have inherited a, a mutation that is directly related to breast cancer, they don't necessarily get breast cancer in their lifetime. We know they have the gene, but they don't get it. So there is a lot of talk about, okay, I've inherited this. What are the things that I can do to actually make it less likely that that mutation expresses itself as a cancer? And that's where exercise, um, diet. So the mm -hmm. breast cancer, the breast anti-breast cancer diet, if you like, is the mm -hmm. anti-heart disease diet, which is the Mediterranean diet. So mm -hmm. this is um, basically a diet that's based on whole grains, fruit and vegetables, fish, and at least two tablespoons of olive oil a day. So oh. that that is the diet that we used to have in this region, for example, before all the fast foods <laughs> came in. Um, so diet, um, you can avoid alcohol. You mm. can exercise. And, and the, the studies on exercise, you know, it, it doesn't have to be like kickboxing and all these kind of like strenuous things. It's literally walking half an hour a day or an hour alternate days. You know, it's very moderate exercise. So those are things that you can actually do because one of the things that I've seen in my own practice, um, uh, just for your listeners, if, if they are mostly from the Philippines, is when we look at the epidemiology of breast cancer. So we wanna see around the world who has the most breast cancer. So the highest mm. incidence is, is in the West, North America, Western Europe, Australia. And when we look to see the lowest incidences of breast cancer, it's in the, um, uh, it's in the Far East. But amongst the Far East, the Philippines is one of the highest incidences of breast cancer. And I don't know why that is. And so I don't know if that's a dietary thing, uh, uh, environmental thing or what, but generally um, Filipinos within the Far East have a high incidence of breast cancer. Oh, that's sad to hear. But I think, you know, what I found also, if you're overgiving, <laughs> Filipino mothers are the most overgiving persons I've met. <laughs> In terms of everything, everything. <laughs> you know? I know. I know. I mean, they will take care of others, not themselves. So this is the culture. So <laughs> I think it stems from that. But maybe both the environment, the food. I agree. We're not used to eating the Mediterranean diet. <laughs> yes, 
Exactly. So, and I think even if you look at, okay, the uh, other people in the Far East also don't eat a Mediterranean diet, but they do tend to eat, think of a Vietnamese diet, they do yeah. tend to eat more steamed things rather than, I notice the Filipinos eat a lot of fried foods. <laughs> and, they also like, and they like a lot of junk food, you know? Yeah, so I know. I think, yeah, so I think all those things are uh, difficult, you know? I agree with you. A healthy, a healthy body comes from a healthy diet, you know. And I think that's right. That's our right. Culture somehow, <laughs> not in the healthy. <laughs> no, doctor. We're almost towards the end. I know a lot of people. I mean, being the first, you know, UAE national lady surgeon. What is your advice? I know a lot of women want to be some, you know, somebody. <laughs> that if, want, if they want to follow your path to be, you know, an oncologist or to be a breast cancer surgeon, what is your best advice to these women who, who wants to change life like yours? Ah, uh, no, people who are already doctors who want to do this or? No, like to be like you, yeah. How, how to be like you, doctor? <laughs> I think, I don't know if it's, I mean, you know, one of the things that's lovely is actually, you know, for me, what I try to do now is um, go to schools and try to encourage uh, girls into science, into medicine, and then the ones mm -hmm. that are in medicine to see surgery as a viable option. Because for me, I know I didn't have anybody to look up to and even yeah. uh, and, and definitely nobody who looked like me, you know, <laughs> and I think that's so important because, you know, as they mm -hmm. say, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So yeah. it's, um, one of the things that uh, my medical school did is they have a picture of me outside the exam hall. And mm -hmm. they've said that um, they the, the, uh, her, have some of the students say to me that they'll stand there waiting to get into the exam hall and they look at my picture and they'll go, you know what, if she can do it, I can do it. And I think that's so important. And the other thing is, as I said before, you know, I didn't, it wasn't about, I want to be the first this, or I want to do that. It was literally about following what I was enjoying, what I had a passion mm -hmm. for, what I was mm -hmm. good at. And then seeing that there was a need for something and then following that route. Oh, this is your ikigai, Dr. Huria. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. And yeah. I did it without even knowing it had a name. <laughs> I think the good thing, you fell into it at the right. I mean, a lot of people are struggling, you know, but I think you rightly said, you know, it's good to meet and see people like you who are living their ikigai because you're loving what you're doing, you're passionate about it. Is that something that you plan? It's something that's, you know, a journey, right, that you've been into. Now, yeah. I know there's Well Women Clinic in Dubai. How can people, you know, if they want to get a checkup, if they want to visit your clinic, maybe you can share all the contact information about you and your clinic and, you know, how. what are the services that your company is offering? Yeah, so the clinic we have, so I'm, I'm a, a cancer surgeon, so I usually just see either cancer patients or those who are at high risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, I have in my clinic um, another surgeon who sees uh, low risk patients and we also have two screeners. So these are doctors who will screen you not just for breast cancer, but for a host of um, women related uh, illnesses. Oh, that's good. So, doctor, we will, of course, give all your website information, contact information of Well Women Clinic. I know you also have something called Breast Friends. Can you talk more about that? Yes. So, Breast Friends is um, when I first came back, and obviously, I was starting my practice, I was working as a surgeon, but I felt that the, the women could use support. Um, mm. psychological support, but not necessarily mm. from a psychologist. I mean, as women, we like to um, uh, we like to talk our problems out, <laughs> right? This is how yes. we deal with things. When something's bothering yeah. us, you know, we call up our best friend and we have a long conversation about it. And so I felt there was a need for this, but again, it was a difficult thing to approach here because um, especially the local women, you know, it's not part of our culture to talk about things um, mm. that are very serious like that. 
you know, so women would have cancer and be going through treatment and only the people in her house, you know, her husband, sometimes yeah. not their mother, sometimes not their kids know that they're mm -hmm. actually having treatment. Um, so, but I, but that doesn't mean they didn't need to talk about it. So I started initially just putting patients one-on-one -on -one together, just people I would match them sort of for age or language spoken, that kind of thing, where I felt that, um, they would benefit from each other. And then we tried to start a support group. And that took a little while because again, everybody thought it was gonna be like an Oprah Winfrey thing where everybody would sit and just, you know, talk about their deepest, darkest secrets. And, and that's not what the women wanted. They wanted to be able to come and meet other women so they could drop their guard and just be themselves and then have some kind of educational talk. Sometimes we, fun things, we do dance classes, we do art classes. Um, and and so the, the meetings that we've run now, we just celebrated our 19th year um, wow. of, of the support group. And the group has kind of um, merged into sort of a three part group. So we have one, the first part of the meeting uh, for those who really do want to have um, a little bit more uh, information but also an exchange of their feelings at that part of the meeting is run by a psychologist and a life coach and mm. then the second part we would have is something that is more um, educational a, a lecture a talk sometimes on something related to cancer but sometimes not we'll have people who come in and talk about complementary uh, medicine uh, and other uh, therapies that are available in the community and then we also have a kind of an informal mingling and um, you know having tea and biscuits and things and and that's sort of an informal way of sharing um, with other women who have had a similar experience. So that's been going on now for 19 years. So we're in our 20th year, actually. And, um, and then we also, as part of that, what we try to do is raise money or have companies in, in the region raise money that help women um, pay for their uh, cancer treatment. Wow, that's really something. Now, doctor, if people want to work with you on the charity, you know, be a member, if they want to support, you know, the cost of the people who need help in terms of funding, how can they do that? Can you, can so you we, I can share it with you, the, um, our, our website. And okay, yeah. Okay, we will share everything on the website. So today, doctor, um maybe any last words before we end this interview i've learned so much in terms of you said one in three women you know are prone to having cancer but the good news is that it's getting treated you know less people are having so exactly. the best way is to do this screening mammograms to prevent you know and of course seek doctors who are experts and i think you know what i've learned today is that if you know there's really no no direct reason of why you will have it or why you're having it but exactly. the best <laughs> the best is to take care of yourself in all aspects you know and i think maybe some last few words before we end it. yeah i think you know it's important that we recognize that we are important as women that we are mothers and sisters and daughters and a lot of people depend on us and so it is our job to take care of ourselves we're always so busy taking care of everybody else. You yourself said that, you know, mothers, mm -hmm. the Filipino mothers are the most giving. I think all mothers are. And I think we, at, at you know, unfortunately thinking about everybody else and then ourselves suffer. So one mm -hmm. is being proactive about your health. So not waiting until you feel a lump, not waiting until something feels different. Once a year, having a full check you know, your blood pressure, your sugar, a pap smear, your breasts. And then um, uh, uh, if, God forbid, you do find something that looks or feels or something is not right, then don't sit on it. Go see somebody, you know. It may be that it's fine, but at least, or it may not be fine, but at least you're picking it up early. Mm. 
So, doctor, thank you, thank you. I think I agree with you. I think mothers, we play a lot of role. Women specifically, you're right. You are, you know, you're a mother, a daughter, a sister, and then a wife, and then a friend. It was like, which one, right? And then you forgot to take care of yourself. I mean, I've learned it the hard way. <laughs> but thankfully, after, you know, after surviving burnout, I learned how to pause, how to stop, how to seek help. And I yep. think... I want to encourage those women if you are feeling you know i think our body will always have a message if something is wrong and i think it's good to know that there are doctors now like doc i mean i think the, the biggest fear also is there's something that you feel in your breast and you're going to see a man who's a doctor right but if you know it's a woman then you already feel safe <laughs> and yeah. that's right so it's exactly. good to know that you doctor or Horia, you know, you've been doing this for some time. And I think I can feel how much this work is so meaningful to you. And I think I, I want also to inspire other women that, you know, if you want to become like Dr. Horia, I mean, she's living a testament of what's possible, right? As you rightly said, doctor, if you can do it, others can do it. Exactly. So I, I hope you continue to be, um, you know, an inspiration to many women to follow their path, to take care of themselves. And I hope forward to seeing you again soon. And I hope to meet you really. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I will drop all the social media links um, and also okay. the, the Well Women Clinic, uh, the, the Breast Friends. And the friends. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. See you. God bless you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you for watching Cancer Conversations with Coach Wanda. This is episode one. On episode one, let me summarize what Dr. Gloria Kazim, the first UAE national lady breast surgeon, explained to us all about breast cancer. If you want to prevent, you know, breast cancer, the good news is that we can do it through a healthy lifestyle. So make sure that you exercise, eat the right food, and avoid alcohol. She also explained in terms of detection, if you want to detect breast cancer ahead, it's stop waiting for the lump you know, to come out or the blood in your nipple to come out. Get yourself screened through screening mammograms, and you have to do it specifically if you're age 40 and above. In terms of curing cancer, she shared that there are many ways to heal cancer now. I mean, breast cancer, there are many cases of people having it, but the good news is that survival rates are increasing. And you can get cured through radiation, therapy, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, and surgery. So get yourself checked get yourself the right doctor if you want to get more information about dr huria kazim she's based here in dubai she have the well woman clinic and she also has something called breast friends breast friends is a support for women who have breast cancer all the information check the link below and we will share it and of course i would like to thank you for watching us live or on replay i hope today you get to learn a lot about how to prevent detect and cure breast cancer again this cancer conversations podcast is something that i started because after being diagnosed you know my mother has lung cancer and after being diagnosed i learned that there's so much lack of information in terms of cancer and there needs to be awareness in terms of what could be done to prevent detect and cure it so if you're a company consultant or coach in the business of preventing treating supporting cancer patients and their caregivers i would like to invite you to be our next guest please go to bit-ly podcast partner form fill up the form and we would love to have you on our upcoming episode so thank you thank you for watching us live we're on on replay and also i want to thank katan social media marketing for producing this podcast katan social media marketing we are a team of LinkedIn podcast experts. We stream our live podcast on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube because our goal is to get seen, get heard, and you know, get your message out there so the right people can come and find you. If you want to know more how Paltan Social Media Marketing can help you 
get seen, get heard, get clients. We tailor fits TMO services for you and your business needs. So send us a message. My team and I would love to help you. If you don't know me yet, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Juan Dalin Tan Halibig. I am the 2021 number one most influential Filipina on LinkedIn and a top 15 LinkedIn expert in Dubai. I use my experience and expertise. You know, by profession, I'm a certified public accountant and audit manager, but I know the world needs a lot of information right now about cancer. So I'm starting this Cancer Conversation podcast to share insightful information and inspiring stories from healers, healthcare experts, cancer patients, caregivers, and survivors to shed light, give information, give support, because I know a lot of people need help, and I hope this podcast called Cancer Conversations with Coach Wanda help you today. If you want more information, watch the video because we will share more in terms of what are the upcoming episodes that we have. And also, if you want to know more about health and social media marketing, watch this video. See you on the next episode. God bless you.